When it comes to air quality, the bad news is that wildfires and air pollution have really degraded the quality of our air. But the good news is that we're all realizing that the quality of our air, and particularly the quality of our indoor air, is really darn important. I'm so excited to tell you about Puro Air because in 30 minutes, this device will remove allergens, dust, smoke, and gases from your room. It uses a stronger type of filter called a HEPA-14, and it filters pollutants at a microscopic level. I keep my Puro Air running upstairs where the bedrooms are all night. I love that it's quiet. Cleaner air just hits different, doesn't it? Check out everything Puro Air has to offer at getpuroair.com. That's G-E-T-P-U-R-O-A-I-R.com. One more time for the people in the back, getpuroair.com. Well, hello there, my friends, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 454. We've been doing this 454 times, 454 of Sustainable Minimalists. This is a listener-supported show all about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. On today's show, we're zeroing in on the potentially harmful toxins that surround us each and every day. And specifically today, we're covering free ways, I should say, that you and I can reduce our exposures, reduce our family's exposures as well. And again, we're not spending a single cent doing so. Today, my guest is Reagan Nelson. She is the host of the Clean and Green Living podcast. Reagan, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. I can't wait to glean your expertise. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Well, again, excited to have you. Let's start by you telling us about yourself. Starting a podcast is a lofty endeavor. Let's let's put it like that. Why on earth did you start the Clean and Green Living podcast? It's a good question. And yes, it is an endeavor. And I think I was completely naive going into it. Ignorance is bliss. So I actually have a master's degree in exercise physiology. So health has been on top of mind for my entire life, really growing up in a really active community. I was very interested in feeling good and being outdoors. And then I translated that into both my undergraduate and graduate work. And I was really primarily focused on sport performance. I worked at Nike and the Nike Sport Research Lab when I first started my professional career. It was interesting because at the time, which was now 20, 20 years ago, I really thought the diet and exercise were the two most important components of health. And people really weren't talking about sleep. They weren't talking about mental health as much as they are now. And they definitely were not talking about how our personal care products or our cleaning products or our laundry products or packaging has chemicals in it that could be impacting our hormones or our neurological health. They just weren't. It was not top of mind. Some of that is because these chemicals actually haven't been in our in commerce for that long. I think it's over 80,000 chemicals have been introduced into commerce since World War II. Less than 10% have ever been tested for human health and safety. And it really has not been until the last decade that it's become more mainstream, clean and green living to focus on the area that I'm most passionate about. And that's really educating people about our exposure to toxic chemicals in our everyday life and providing people with easy and affordable ways to reduce that exposure and ultimately to have a healthier, happier, safer, and more sustainable life. Hmm. Well, we're definitely going to talk about those affordable, keyword free ways to do that today. But I'm just curious. I mean, as somebody who feels a certain way and tries to educate others about perhaps a different way some people might want to explore, I generally find that if I'm talking to 100 people, 10 people are interested <laughs> in sustainable minimalism, and 90 people just don't care. <laughs> so 
I'm wondering whether those percentages translate into your life as a clean living advocate. And if so, how do you continue on when the vast majority of people just don't care about what you're saying? Yeah, it's hard. Dr. Leonardo Trasande, who wrote a book called Sicker, Fatter, Poor, he's been a guest on my show twice. He's a pediatrician at NYU and a health researcher, an incredibly knowledgeable man. He said that this is a problem that 99% of people are affected by, and yet only 1% know about it. So I try to really start from that perspective of the average person has no idea that every day we are exposed to toxic chemicals in our personal care products and our cleaning products and our household products like laundry detergent, but we just don't know. And that's because we assume that the government is regulating these products and that if you can sell it in a CVS or a Walgreens or a Target and we can put it on our body, that it's safe. And that's just simply not the case. So while there are a lot of people who don't care, I try to come at it from the lens of there are a lot of people who just don't know. So my goal is just to be that like tipping point for people. Maybe it's a tipping point or maybe it's a starting point to helping them know better. It may take them five years. It may take them 10 years. They may never make the change. But I just keep putting one foot in front of the other with the goal of educating as many people as I can. And as Leo said in in our last podcast, he goes, if this conversation prompts one or two people to make a positive change, then we're making progress. And if we can get to 2% of people knowing about this issue or 3% of people knowing about this issue, then that's going to be better than staying at one. Yes, I, I feel that. So I'm just playing devil's advocate. I'm assuming that I would have listeners who are listening to our conversation right now and they're thinking to themselves, well, chemical hazards, environmental toxins, like on the list of things to be worried about, that is probably pretty low on my list. Like (laughs) we have natural disasters due to more frequent and more powerful storms due to climate change. We have the threat of nuclear war. We have pandemics. We have this, we have that. Chemical toxins probably aren't on the top 10. What would you say to listeners who would say, you know, chemical toxins (laughs) don't make my top 10 or maybe even my top 20 fears? Well, first, I would say I understand that there are a lot of really big problems in this world. And that's kind of sad. (laughs) Not kind of sad. It's really sad. There is always going to be something drastic and really large scale. But I think we also have to look at our own individual scale and our individual health. I just had Suzanne Price, who's the CEO of Breast Cancer Prevention Partners on my show. We talked about the fact that there has been a rise in breast cancer and a rise in cancer, all cancers in young people. And one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. 90% of breast cancer is not solely genetic. That means that environmental factors are causing breast cancer. There are a lot of environmental factors, as you just mentioned personal care products and what we put on our body and what we put in our body, how we eat, our skin is our largest organ. Everything we put on it absorbs in, not everything, but most things. We can't ignore that fact. You may have seen in the New York Times recently, and this was across many news platforms, the headline that said, girls are going through puberty earlier and we don't know why. We do know why. We know that these endocrine disrupting chemicals are in our plastic packaging, they're in our perfume and our lotion, and they're everywhere. They're in our water. PFAS chemicals are in our water. They are ubiquitous. And while many of them are transient chemicals, which means our body can actually detoxify them through our liver and through our kidneys, which is great news, many of them are also forever chemicals, PFAS, for example there is very little opportunity for our body to rid itself of these chemicals. So I would say there are big problems in this world. 
is this the biggest? Probably not. But if you're concerned about your long-term health, if you're concerned about your reproductive health, if you're, maybe you've already had children, do you want grandchildren someday? If you say yes, then you should probably be paying attention to this issue. Mm. That answer provides a mic drop moment. I mean, (laughs) you just laid it out perfectly. And we're talking about ways in which we can care without spending any money. That's the key, right? Like we can make a world of difference in our own sphere without spending money. We're going to talk about seven of those ways today. And specifically, the ways we're talking about today are There are things we already know we should be doing or should be avoiding, but we likely aren't, (laughs) or we aren't doing it enough or well enough to make an impact. So let's start with the one that I'm honestly having some trouble with, and that is taking and keeping your shoes off in the house. I'm going to be honest right off the bat. We are a shoe free house, a shoe free house, I guess is what we would call it. I've never called it that before, but it's a shoe free house. However, There's so many opportunities for me to leave the house and realize I forgot something and then just run back in with my shoes on because I don't have five seconds. Yes, I do have five seconds, but I tell myself in that moment, I don't have five seconds to take my shoes off. So I run around the house in my shoes, get what I needed. Usually it's my cell phone and then run back out the house. So let's talk about taking off and keeping our shoes off inside. How is that? a significant toxin reducer. Well, first of all, I'm laughing at you about going back in your house because (laughs) my most viewed Instagram reel is me in my actually Nordic ski boots on the mat that sits right inside my garage door. And I use that song every day I'm shuffling and it's me shuffling across the floor in my boots because I didn't want to take them off. So if you have a mat by your door, you can always try that technique. It's not very fast, but, or I sometimes I tiptoe, which also, you know, less touching the ground, but progress, not perfection. So if 90% of the time you are not wearing your shoes in your home, that's better than 100% of the time having your shoes on. When you walk outside, there are all sorts of chemicals, be it pesticides that are sprayed on the lawn or public right away rainwater wash off from restaurants. I mean, there's everything known to man on the street. So the best thing you can do is to leave that on the outside and keep your shoes in your garage, outside your front door, in a mudroom. And then you have a nice clean space on the inside. If you have young children who are still crawling on the ground too, or even if you sit on the floor to do your stretches, think about where you've walked, and then you put your hands on that, and then you might touch your face, and now you're putting the chemicals on your face, or you're maybe even touching your mouth. The more you can keep those out of your house, the better off you'll be. And it costs nothing. Yeah. So in many cultures around the world, taking your shoes off is a sign of respect for the homeowner, right? But in America, we seem to (laughs) not do that. If you're going into somebody's house, take your shoes off. You will just save the homeowner a lot of stress and awkwardness in asking you to take them off. And let's also remember, too, that if you're in the habit of wearing shoes in your own home, research abounds with the fact that lead and other heavy metals that come from soil, they are on your shoes. You might not be able to see it, but it's there. The lawn chemicals that you or perhaps your neighbors spray on their lawns are on your shoes. And so what I love about this first tip, like take your shoes off in your home and leave them off, is that there's always more to do, right? So for me, we are a shoe-free house. We never wear shoes in the house, yet there's still better that I can do better in terms of when I forget my whatever, I can take the five seconds, like how hard is it to take my shoes off in the garage, run in and get what I want, and then come back out. It's free. It takes five seconds. And the potential benefits are huge. So thank you for that. All right. So now we got to go on to the next one. And it has to do with saran wrap. You say, 
that we need to stop using saran wrap. And, and again, this is, probably isn't a surprise to my listeners because saran wrap is plastic, but it's so darn convenient. So take it away. Why should we stop with the saran wrap? Well, I mean, there are so many reasons that any single use plastic are not good for us and good for the planet. And so I would just encourage you to use up what you have. I'm not a proponent of throwing things away. I think I actually just ran out of the Costco saran wrap that I'd had for probably seven years. I didn't throw it away. I kept it around because there are times when, you know, I would go to someone else's house or I'd send someone home with something. And it was an appropriate opportunity to use it. Um, but now I don't have it. So I love, you know, there are plenty of alternatives. Melly Wraps is a company from Maui. It's who I use. They're a beeswax coated wrap. You can also put things into silicone plastic bags if you have those. There is some purchasing that can be necessary to replace things like aluminum foil and saran wrap. But it doesn't mean you have to do it. You may already have a glass Tupperware that you could take that same piece of pizza and put it inside of. And so just think about ways that you can reduce your use of it versus fully eliminating because every step is a step in the right direction. For my listeners who are curious, like, what's the problem with plastic wrap? Well, yes, it's a single-use plastic, which is deleterious to the environment, but there's also BPA in there. There's LDPE, low-density polyethylene. There's something else, DIDP. I'm not even going to pronounce this right, but I'm going to try. Diisinyl phthalate, which is phthalates. I mean, longtime listeners to this show, you know that we are actively trying to reduce our exposure to phthalates, and yet we're continuing to use saran wrap. Uh, and so all this stuff is all this stuff and more is in saran wrap, and yet we're still using it because it's so darn convenient. I mean, the the beeswax wraps, I've made them, I've bought them, and they're okay, but to me personally, they're not a they're not as simple of a solution. I get you. Yeah. I have a suggestion when it comes to safety, because yes, in plastics, there are phthalates, uh, there are other bisphenols, things like that. You can always take parchment paper and stick it inside of your aluminum foil or your plastic wrap if you want to decrease your exposure to those plastics. That's one simple way that you can help to reduce exposure. The other thing is don't microwave plastic. Any type of plastic, do not heat it. Same thing, don't put your plastic in the dishwasher. Like if you have plastic lids to your glass containers, or even if you have plastic containers, do not heat that because you get more off-gassing and leaching of those chemicals when you heat them. So again, those are ways to reduce your exposure. I'm not telling you to buy anything or change what you have, just some simple behavior changes. Because you probably... I mean, Stephanie, you might have parchment paper in your house, right? So I'm not telling you you have to get rid of saran wrap. Just put the parchment paper down first, then wrap it in saran. I like that. And just going back to your heating of saran wrap, like growing up, we used saran wrap. We put it over our leftovers because we always had leftovers. We heated it up with the saran wrap on top. I mean, who didn't? <laughs> that was the thing. Uh, however, recent research shows that exposure to the phthalates and to the other potentially hazardous chemicals in this saran wrap, your exposure is increased by up to 55% when you heat it up. So never heat up your saran wrap and never heat up your plastic cover. We've said it so many times on this show, but reminder time. If you do it once, do it zero. So we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the skip the slip campaign. I had no idea this was a thing. We're going to talk about receipts, but we're going to take our ad break first. So we'll see you in a minute after our quick sponsor break. You know what time it is. It's almost Easter. And for my parents listening, you know Easter means making the Easter basket. If you are tired of giving your kids candy in the baskets, perhaps this is the year to give your children some fizzy, sudsy fun from Dabble and Dollop. Dabble and Dollop has you covered with everything you need to make bath time fun, shampoos, bubble baths, 
body washes, conditioners, bath bombs, you name it. And guess what? The best part is these products are clean. Yes, they are. They're phthalate-free, paraben-free, SLS-free. I could go on and on, but they are Stephanie-approved. Give your kids the best in their baskets this Easter. Visit dabblebath.com slash sustainable today to get 20% off your first order. D-A-B-B-L-E-B-A-T-H dot com slash sustainable and get 20% off for being a listener of Sustainable Minimalists today. So many of us have chaotic closets that are crammed full of clothing items, and yet somehow we still have nothing to wear. Well, upgrading to high quality and affordable pieces from Quince when you need them is a game changer. They offer organic cotton sweaters and washable silk tops. My 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters are my go-to. Not only are they affordable, but the quality is top-notch They wear better than the cashmere sweaters that are double their price. Indulge in affordable luxury. Go to quince.com slash sustainable podcast for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash sustainable podcast to get free shipping and 365 day returns. One more time, quince.com slash sustainable podcast. And we're back. Today I'm speaking with Reagan Nelson. She is the host of the Clean and Green Living podcast. She advocates for easy and affordable lifestyle changes that support your safer and more sustainable life. Before the break, we discussed saran wrap. We also discussed taking your shoes off inside, like all the time, not just 95% of the time. And now we're moving on to those receipts. My listeners, you already know there's BPA in those receipts. A free way we can reduce our exposure to potentially hazardous chemicals is to skip the slip. Yeah, I mean, it's, the world has made it so easy for us not to take receipts. Thermal receipts are coated in bisphenol BPA and We know that when it comes into contact with our skin, that it is an endocrine disruptor. Many people don't know this, but BPA was actually created in the 70s as a synthetic estrogen to help women maintain pregnancies. It was then replaced with another far more toxic chemical that actually caused uterine cancer. It was shown that women who were given that uh, hormonal treatment, the synthetic hormone, had offspring with higher incidence of uterine cancer in women and then also, I think, testicular cancer in boys. I only tell you that to show you that these, these synthetic chemicals like the bisphenols, they really do have an impact on our health. So when we say it's a hormone disruptor, you can see that these kind of chemicals have that result. They happen to be in thermal receipts. A lot of retailers have transitioned away from using the BPA thermal paper That doesn't mean they are not also doing what we call regrettable substitution, which is sort of like whack-a-mole, where you take BPA and you replace it with BPS. So there is BPA through Z, and there are lots of things where you'll see like BPA-free, but that does not mean they're not using BPS. With receipts, if they are doing that kind of substitution, it is so simple for us just not to take them um, because we can get them emailed to us, texted to us, which is such a great luxury. If you do need that receipt for business purposes or you're tracking receipts for whatever reason, my other tip that costs you nothing is to wash your hands immediately afterwards. And I think a lot of people don't think about that. You know, we wash our hands before we eat or after we go to the bathroom. But one way to reduce your exposure to chemicals is also by washing your hands right after you come into contact with them. Hmm. We need to talk about hand washing because I'm doing it wrong. My kids are definitely doing it wrong, and I think maybe my listeners are as well. So we're going to talk about that next. But just to go back to the receipts for a minute, 93% of paper receipts are coated with that BPA or that BPS. BPA and BPS are endocrine disruptors. They mess with your hormones. Like, I can't, I can't understate that. (laughs) I mean, do you want your receipt messing with your hormones? 
I'm going to go ahead and guess that the answer is no. And so I'm thinking back to my childhood. My mother would always take a receipt. She would always take it because she needed to balance her checkbook or something, (laughs) right? But this is one of those instances in which buying less and buying smarter, being a minimalist, being a conscious consumer works in your favor, right? Because if I'm only buying what I know I need, there's a reduced chance I need to return the item I just bought. And so if I don't need to return what I just bought, I don't need the receipt, (laughs) right? I just don't need it. And then there's also the fact, too, that, you know, I always thought, oh, I don't want it emailed to me because then they just want my email and then they're going to put me on their email list and then they're going to send me all their stuff. Well, what, which is more of a potential hazard, getting an email to buy more stuff with a receipt or touching this receipt, right? So don't get a receipt if you can help it. And I did read something in preparation for this interview that said that if you must take a receipt, so if the lovely cashier hands you a receipt and you don't know what to do, you don't want to say, oh, back away, you have to take it. A slightly better option is to take the receipt and fold it with the ink on the inside. So like take it, put the ink on the inside and then fold it up. Just a thought there. But now we must move into washing our hands. We always frame washing our hands with regard to bacteria and viruses and germs. But you're going to tell me, Reagan, that washing our hands is really darn important for washing off those potentially hazardous chemicals and toxins. So take it away. Yeah. So I actually had my urine tested for... I think it was 13 chemicals, including bisphenols, parabens, phthalates. And I did that with a company called Million Marker. I actually had the founder, Jenna Hua, on, on my first podcast. And I was shocked to find that my low molecular weight phthalates, which are the flexible, like plasticized, softening plasticized, soft plastic, um, were really quite high. And Jenna helped me deduce from her own experience that the reason I was having this high level of phthalates, despite the fact that I do so many things to reduce my exposure, was because of packing tape. It's because I like to sell things on eBay and Poshmark because I, you know, it's part of my, my lifestyle choices. And so I tend to use a lot of packing tape. Well, packing tape has phthalates in it. Sometimes I'll also tear the tape with my teeth. Anyone else have that? You know, when it doesn't quite work and you're putting the tape on the box and you don't have scissors and you use your mouth. So that said, if you have traditional packing tape, which you can actually smell, it's very strong. That's that's the phthalates that you're smelling. Wash your hands afterwards. It's just one really simple way. I'm not telling you to stop using tape, but wash your hands because it is absorbing into your into your system mm-hmm. simply by touching it or putting it in your mouth like I was, <laughs> sadly. Yes. And quick reminder, how many of us are scrubbing our hands for 20 seconds? 20 seconds is a really long time. (laughs) Yeah. They they sing happy birthday, I think is the, is the, you know, if you tell your children, make sure they sing a full, nice, slow, happy birthday while they're washing their hands. Yeah. So reminder to the kids listening, but better reminder for the adults listening, like, are you singing happy birthday when you're washing your hands? If not, that's something you can work on. Mm -hmm. That's something you can work on. All right, so let's move on. I want to talk about synthetic fragrance. You always suggest we avoid synthetic fragrances. I'm on board with that, but let's start first by discerning natural fragrance from synthetic fragrance. What's the difference? Yeah, so, and this is a little bit nuanced. Not all synthetic fragrance is necessarily bad, but whenever you see just the word fragrance, on a product that could be a candle, a lotion, a cleaning product, personal care product, that does not mean one ingredient. Fragrance is a trade secret. And so companies do not have to tell you what is in their fragrance because of that. It's protected. It's called the fragrance loophole from a legislative standpoint. And within any fragrance, you might find 50 chemicals, or it could be 10 chemicals. Some might be natural. 
some may be synthetic. Uh, natural and synthetic, I, I just again want to be clear, it does not mean natural does not mean good. As you mentioned, lead is naturally occurring and it's not good for us. And synthetic doesn't necessarily mean bad. But if that company doesn't have to tell us what's in it, we have no ability to decipher what is good and bad. We don't even know what's there. And so a very easy way to reduce your exposure to chemicals, especially if you don't know what's in them, is simply by avoiding anything that has that word fragrance on it. One of the most common ingredients hidden in that fragrance loophole are phthalates. And phthalates, as we've talked about, are an endocrine disruptor. They are especially concerning. I mean, they're concerning for both genders. They are especially concerning for men. We have seen a significant decline in sperm count in the last two generations. There's a brilliant scientist, Dr. Shauna Swan. She wrote a book called Countdown. Um, her research is dedicated to phthalates and their impact on sperm count. So a lot of men think that this is just a women's issue because women use makeup and women buy personal care products more and use them traditionally more than men. But I can tell you that this is something that is affecting every single person, nearly every single person, 99.9%, as I mentioned earlier. And these phthalates are one of the many ingredients that are often hidden in that fragrance. So we have one, maybe two, I would say we had 1.5 more <laughs> things to discuss. The next one is opening the windows and the doors. You say that opening our homes to the outside environment is a powerful way to reduce exposure to these potentially harmful chemicals, pollutants, et cetera. Talk to me yeah, about it. Yeah, it's funny that we're talking about this today because we have a molecule, which is an air um, filter. And my husband just this morning said, when I open the door, it goes down. And when I close the door, it goes up again. <laughs> so. We have things in our home, furniture, um, a lot of uh, wood particles have formaldehyde in them, laminated wood products, sofas have flame retardant sprayed on them. There are just so many things in our home where that are off-gassing, VOCs, paint. And simply by opening your doors and windows and allowing cross-ventilation, you are moving those volatile organic com compounds through and out of your home. Running your vent fan, especially if you have a gas stove when you're cooking, is really a great thing to do because there's now new evidence that benzene uh, is actually uh, off-gassed when we run our gas stove. We know benzene is a carcinogen. I believe it's in New York City. They just passed it. Any new buildings that are built in New York City will not have gas stoves. So there's going to be a huge shift towards induction cooktops, which are widely used in Europe, they're more energy efficient, and they also don't have that off-gassing. So I immediately, whenever I put anything on my gas stove, I turn my vent fan on. And if you live in an environment where you can also have your doors and windows open, again, it's just a really simple and cost-free way to have some of those chemicals be passing through versus staying. Yeah. Open your windows even when it's not 70 degrees and sunny. Open your windows, even if it's 58 degrees and it's a little cold, just open them for like 20 minutes. Let the stuff leave, like let the movement of air go in and out. This, of course, is with the caveat that you're living in a place in which your outdoor it's air fresh. quality yeah. is is fresh. Yes. And of course, I mean... This is the point five part to our conversation. I'm guessing you would say, you know, you as a minimalist myself, I say, I say to you all the time, uh, use less products, use less personal care and cleaning products, because by just using, desiring, needing less, we reduce our exposure without even trying. Yes, a hundred percent. Less is more. The average woman uses. 13 products, personal care products every day. That's around 114 unique ingredients. Um, men are around 11 products and about 105 ingredients. Fascinatingly enough, since 2004, men have almost doubled their usage of personal care products. So men can use less because we know they were back in 2004. So you guys can go backwards. 
Um, and women can use less as well. I think focus on a few highly effective and high quality products. You don't need everything. There's this huge craze with girls right now. I have a 12 year old, almost 13 year old around this like Sephora girl and makeup and their skincare routines and skincare fridges. I mean, it's just promoting excessive consumption and it's really promoting unnecessary usage of products, products that girls and their skin do not need. They don't need a wrinkle serum. They're not worried about hydration. I mean, but they're being advertised these kinds of products. So when I approach girls with this conversation, simple, like less is more is always my first message. My second message is make sure that what you're using is really meant for your skin. Because again, our girls don't need a vitamin C serum. They have no sun damage on their lovely little faces because they're 12. And hopefully they've been wearing sunscreen if we're doing our jobs, right? And just, I think less is more. I also really encourage people to look at how long they've had their skincare and makeup products. If you've had something for over a year, it's probably gone bad anyway. That's a great opportunity to clean out and then really look at what you have, identify your routine, focus on those key, you know, maybe it's a night cream or a serum or whatever it is, and just have a couple things that you use. And then if you love trying new products, use those up. And then next time, buy something new. I always promote safer. So make sure you're looking at the ingredients in those products. And then just quickly, I want to throw in, if you are going to be getting rid of your old products, Pack Collective has a take back program where you can recycle all that packaging. Because I like Stephanie, I'm very into being sustainable. I hate throwing things in the garbage. You can rinse all that out, all the pumps, the tubes, and it will go back to packed. Um, you can drop those at Sephora, they have bins, also Ulta has bins, and they also have a mail-in take-back program. It is a little bit of work because you need to make sure to remove all the product from the pumps and the tubes and the, the plastic jars. But anything less than a yogurt-sized container is not recyclable curbside, but packed will take that back along with supplement bottles. Little side note. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so helpful. Just a quick personal question like i'm just asking this for myself yeah. <laughs> because i have a child who's going to be a teenager soon how do you convince or do you even convince your daughter that she doesn't need a fridge to hold her beauty products for her wrinkles that don't exist uh for her skincare regime that she doesn't need to do it's been tough. I mean, my daughter, like your girls with the minimalism, my daughter has been hearing about safer skincare and cosmetics for pretty much her entire life. And so she knows that this is like, this is what we have. And this is what we use. I also lead classes. I've done live and virtual classes for young girls, for her friends to talk about good skincare and makeup practices how to check for ingredient safety, and then also along these lines of like, what do you need and what should you be using, especially as they start getting acne. Um, I like to preach the 80-20 rule when it comes to girls, because I think with young children, if we tell them nothing, then there is that risk of rebellion. You know, it's like the kid who says no sweets, and then they go to the birthday party and they like get the cake and the cupcakes and the candy, and then they come home in a sugar coma. So I really try to educate girls about 80% of the time you should be making safer choices, following these ideas of using less. Um, and then 20% of the time, it's also okay to have fun with it. My daughter has 15 different nail polish colors from Olive in June. It's a safer nail polish company. She loves doing nails, which is so funny because I have the worst nails and not my thing at all. I'm not going to take her to a salon with any regularity because there's a lot of harmful chemicals in those salons, but I have let her indulge in this nail obsession. And so I think that that's one of those ways that you can balance it. So I think finding ways to integrate a little bit of fun and letting them have that experience, maybe that's just with one product. And that will satisfy that need. 
Well, those are great tips, and I look forward to using them in about six months because <laughs> I feel like my 10-year-old is is there. Regan, tell us where we can find more of you, more of your podcast, more of your goodness. Give us all the details. Yes. Uh, so the podcast is Clean and Green Living, and you can find me on any podcasting platform. My Instagram is Clean and Green Living Podcast. I'm also on Threads at the same name, on Facebook at the Clean and Green Living Podcast. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. It's Reagan Wilson, which is my main name, and Nelson. And I'm going to just go ahead and make it easier for everybody, link to all of it in the show notes. But Reagan, I want to thank you so much. I loved our conversation. I wish you so much success, and I look forward to following you going forward. Thanks, Stephanie. Listeners, that's a wrap. My friends, show notes are at mamaminimalist.com forward slash 454. Everything we talked about, all the links you need, mamaminimalist.com forward slash 454. Before we say goodbye, just a quick note. I would love it if you asked yourself, do you like this show? And if so, how much do you like it? Do you like it enough to leave it a quick review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify? Do you like it enough to support it with $5 a month? $5 a month would get you this episode extended. So extra tips, extra conversation. That's what went out this morning to my subscribers. Thank you so much, supporters. As a supporter of the show, not only are you ensuring that this work continues, but you're also getting 12, yes, that's right, 12 ad-free episodes a month, some of which, like this one, are extended, give you extra exclusive content. So thank you for considering. We will be back on Thursday where we're discussing whether we can have kids and nice things simultaneously, and if so, how. That's Thursday's episode. Stay tuned. Reach out if you need me. I appreciate you, and take care.